Um, humility learned from working on the environment concept art for dying lights. Hi, everyone. Uh, so once again, my name is Katarzyna Ternacka. Um, I'm a senior concept artist and level artist at Techland. And today I'm going to be talking about the humility that I learned from working on environmental concept art for Dying Light. Uh, amongst other titles that I worked on, I obviously worked on Dying Light. Uh, Dead did, did Island, the definitive collection, and my favorite Dying Light, the following. Uh, currently, I'm working on another AAA title for Techland, but I can't talk about it yet, even though it's really, really cool, so you have to trust me. But today, I'm going to be focusing on Dying Light and about the, 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 my process of discovering how big of an impact concept art can have, not only on the visual, obvious visual aspects of the game, but also about the, uh, uh, how how big of an impact it can have on the gameplay and about the process of game making uh, and how concept art influenced different people on the team. But before I tell you how I do it, I'd like to mm, tell you a bit of a story so this is clear where I'm coming from. Uh, because what I'm going to say might not apply to your job description, to your position, to your creative processes or company culture, but they, those things did, however, work for me on Dying Light, so, and they helped me understand what my job really can be about and how can I get better uh, at it. So, four years ago, I joined Techland with virtually no experience besides illustration, and I applied for the only opened uh, concept artist position, which was concept artist for iOS department. And I mentioned briefly on the interview that I'd like to be working on triple A's in the future, but I had no idea this may happen anytime soon, taking into consideration my lack of experience. I did got surprised, and after two months, I moved to, uh, to Dying Light, and you can imagine it was quite a bit of a shock to move from cutesy, cartoony 2D side-scrollers to open-world production in a realistic setting with parkour and zombies. So, yeah. I had a lot to learn. I had to learn it fast, and I started in, um, in Dying Light as a junior concept artist for interiors, and with the time I became the regular concept artist and learned how to do very simple textures. But by the end of the production, when pretty much all concept arts were done, uh, I gradually turned into a full-time level artist. And uh, working with the engine and understanding how the game is made more down to the metal, um, I understood uh, what features work the best in actual game environment, what features of the engine uh, work the best, and which things uh, create problem, pr problems. But most importantly, I got to work with uh, concept arts, and I saw which, which solutions proposed by concept artists, often myself, work the best in the game, and which are problematic and should be avoided. And that getting on the other side of the ba barricade and like mm, becoming the receiver of the concept art, using other people's concept art for my level art uh, work, or even creating them for myself, has shown me a completely new perspective on concept art and what it can be, and most importantly, how it, how it is actually used, and that becoming the receiver and using concept art is something that uh, I'd like to recommend to every concept artist. Find a way to use the concept art the way your team members do, because um, that has completely changed my perspective on things. Um, because without the humility that comes with understanding how your job influences people and how your job is used by people, and how big of an impact you have on, on the non-visual aspects of the game, it's very easy to fall in a trap of just leveling your artistic skills and neglecting game maker's skills. And that is a subject of a completely separate talk, but I think what's at least partially responsible for this is some kind of a confusion online on what's the exact difference between promo art and concept art. Because uh, well, when you Google concept art, some of them are actually promo art. 
And since that's not a subject of my talk, I'm not going to go into details, but I'd like to just um, get this out of the way. Promo art um, exists to promote the product. It exists to create hype online, to create buzz around the title. Uh, and in order to do so, it needs to be visually appealing to get the attention of potential business partners, of uh, potential clients, meaning players. But it needs to be an eye candy in order to draw the attention, get the, get the likes, get the shares and all that. Uh, <sighs> Um, but it, and it's not a concrete rule, uh, but promo art is usually made when the game is pretty much done or, um, or very close to being done. So promo art illustrates, illustrates the finished product and established ideas. Concept art, however, is made in order to find and establish those ideas. And behind, because behind every concept, there, concept art, there is a question. Um, that it answers a problem that it solves. And uh, some, some concept arts may look like million dollars and they can actually look like promo arts, but some of them are purely functional. And sometimes in the hell uh, chaos of production, there's, exa not, there's not always time to, um, to go into detail. So sometimes concept arts are just purely functional, sloppily, sloppy drafts, photo bashed um, uh, collages, and sometimes even made in 3D because sometimes execution doesn't matter. As long as the concept art sells the idea to how to solve a problem and answer questions. Because behind every concept art, there's a concept that it explains. Uh, when promo art is a cherry on top of the finished product, concept art is a recipe on how to make the cake. In short, this means I'm not going to be talking about pretty pictures today. I will not talk about the composition, light. Uh, I will talk about what is considered, very often considered to be the boring stuff. Um, I will talk about the concept arts that are crazy important and have a huge impact on production, but never get posted on art stations. Uh, about concept arts that are uh, concept arts of generic assets that are by definition invisible. And um, I'll try to tell you how I make try to make sure that my concept art is doing its job. Uh, and for the rest of this talk, I'll focus on how parkour functionality of all assets affected the whole process of creating environmental concept art for Dying Light, and how to make, um, how to make sure that the concept art is as usable as possible by determining its real purpose, gathering the information, and processing the data. But, if we're, but before I tell you how I do it, I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story about a very unfortunate dumpster and how everything that could go wrong went wrong. So story time. Imagine you're an unexperienced concept artist. You got lucky and you just got employed uh, by Techland. And you're going to be working on Dying Light. So once again, to understand all the const uh, constraints that uh, this title imposes on a concept artist or pretty much anybody that's working on the title. Um, a first-person perspective game where everything needs to be very detailed in case the player decides to stick their face against the uh, object, but also needs to look really good from a big distance. An open-world game where you just don't know where the player goes and you have no control over that. A parkour game where they can go wherever they want and they can do that by climbing on top of anything. And every object has its parkour function. Um, a game in a realistic setting where everything needs to look realistic and convincing. Even the craziest level designer's ideas must be based on real world. But you, there was a zombie apocalypse, so you can't really rely on the references from the real world that much. So, you're new to the project. You're excited and hyped on creating amazing, unique locations, and you can't wait to, to paint artistic, expressive um, pieces. You get on board, you read all the documentation, and you pretty much memorize the entire art guide. And you're sitting in your chair, squirming, waiting for your first task, and there it comes, and it's a concept art of a dumpster. 
well, maybe you were a little bit disappointed at first. But you take a deep breath and you think, well, I'm the new guy, of course I got the boring stuff. But uh, you want to show that you're really good and you're good enough to be working here. Uh, so you decide, I'm gonna make that dumpster the coolest freaking dumpster anybody has ever seen. So you read, you read the brief really carefully and you pick what kind of a dumpster it is and you have it all figured. How to support the game tone, how to give it as much as of, uh, of a fun factor as it's possible, how to meet the high production values. And uh, you start drawing and you get focused on really amazing splatters on the side and how did the decals got worn off in a really cool, unique way. Maybe you make it miss one wheel so it's interesting and memorable. You add a sad teddy bear in it so it tells a little bit of a story. And at the end, you add a cool graffiti on the side. And you're really happy with yourself. It is, in fact, the coolest dumpster anybody has ever created. You barely started and you already can't wait to put it in your portfolio once the game is released. It gets approved without thinking, and you start, to wait, start waiting for it to appear in the game. And finally, you see it. You're roaming around the city, parkouring, fighting zombies and enemies, and finally it's there, it's here. It's your first asset, asset. it's done, and it's here, and there, and over there. It's everywhere. And suddenly you realize, well, maybe I shouldn't have put that teddy bear in it. Because, well, now every dumpster in the city has a teddy bear in it. And apparently somebody is walking around the city stealing exactly one wheel from every dumpster. <laughs> but you make a mental note. That's the first thing I learned. There it is. Should have made it more generic. But now imagine half of a year passes. You learned a lot by now, you're more experienced. You come to work on a Monday and you get a task. Find a generic object that can absorb, absorb full damage in a believable way and can be placed around the city in many places and won't draw too much attention to itself. You collect your references, you do your research, maybe you go to Google Street View and you cringe a little bit inside because well, everything seems to be pointing at one direction. Well, a dumpster. But you already made, you already made one dumpster. Maybe we can take the old one and refactor it so it serves for more than one purpose. But it's already placed on the level and can't really change its dimensions. So what do you do? Well, you design another one that's purely fall absorber. And now we have two assets that could have been easily one, which is not very good for optimization. But now imagine another few months passes and you get another task. Find a generic object that can give the player one floor height gain in a believable way and can be placed around the city in many places and won't draw too much attention to itself. Well, you're more experienced now. You know exactly what is needed. You go to Google Street View um, and you start looking for things that, um, things that the eye usually ignores. Things that make the city look <laughs> alive and are just city background. Uh, <laughs> objects that fit the approximate di dimensions from the brief but can be placed everywhere and won't draw any questions. And you start noticing the dumpsters. You ignore them at first, but you can't really shake it. It should be a dumpster. Dumpsters are invisible in just the perfect way. You can put them anywhere. Nobody will ask, what does this dumpster do, do here? But you already made two dumpsters. Well, designing a third one is almost like admitting to a mistake. You look at your second best idea and it's just so much worse. So what do you do? You design, um, uh, do you admit to a mistake or knowingly use not the best idea? Well, you give up. Dumpster, third dumpster it is. Another month passes. 
an object that's exactly 120 centimeters high and can serve as a cover point in a gunfight. <laughs> you stare at the space for a little bit and then you head out for a cigarette to think about life. If only, if only you'd know all the information at the beginning, if only you'd know how important that stupid dumpster will turn out to be. Well, thank God, that story isn't true. It didn't actually happen. It wasn't a dumpster. I've been there. I've been there more than once, and I've seen this happen with me involved, without me, in the art department and outside of it. But the mechanism behind this uh, fake story is not sufficient information about the true purpose of the asset. Um, not understanding all possible functionalities of it and its role in the world, but most importantly, um, what that dumpster would mean to every team member. Because a brief is never perfect. In this case, it may have been created by a level artist that just needed a dumpster because, well, alleys have dumpsters in them. But no level designer ever looked at the brief. So no gameplay functionalities got ever included in it because the level designers simply didn't know the brief existed and somebody is going to be working on dumpsters. Um, and even, even if they both would look at the brief and include all their needs, they'd probably think about different dumpsters because, well, you know how big of a word that is and how many objects fall into this one definition. Um, and I bet each one of you had a dumpster in their head when I was telling the story, and each one of them was completely different. But the point is, making triple A's, especially ridiculously complex like Dynalite, it's just so much chaos. And sometimes things like this just happen, and um, not only in asset production or uh, location production. And you can't expect every brief to include all the data that you need or may need because you can't really expect everybody to know everything, because people simply aren't like this. And the conclusion is making AAAs, making games is really difficult, because it's really complicated, so it's difficult, and there's no shame in admitting that, it's true. So things like this will happen, and you can't always prevent them from happening, but you can try when it comes to your job, and this is how I do it, and to in order to try to prevent this from happening, you need to understand why. Why are you drawing that, that, that stupid dumpster? You need to know how to ask the right questions to get to the bottom of it. Uh, because concept art really can produce more problems than it solves. And that's a trap nobody wants to fall in. So this is how, how I do it. Um, first thing I try to do is recognize the purpose of the concept art. Why am I even doing it? Why do we need this particular concept art? And what will that dumpster be for our game besides being a dumpster? Um, the fake concept art is from the previous story. Um, at first just drew a cool looking dumpster uh, that follow all visual guidelines of the, of the title. Uh, and they focused only on visual aspects of it, which are very important. But in Dying Light, they would be an, actually an, the end game. And my main focus would be on understanding how, uh, what will be the function of that dumpster and what, what will it mean for different people. Because it will mean completely different people, for example. A level artist, for, for a level artist, that dump, the, what they care about that dumpster is where can they place it? Uh, how, it, how does the dumpster raise the values of their location? Is it a dumpster that can they put only in a residential area or maybe a dumpster that belongs on a construction site? What, what is its color? What is its general size? Uh, 3D artists will not care about where can they place that dumpster. They will care about the materials. Is it painted, metal? Maybe they will need a sketch of um, a detailed sketch of the um, geometry and maybe they will need a study on how do dumpsters get dirty. Level designers will not care about how that dumpster looks like at all. Because for them, that dumpster will be... <laughs> because for them, that dumpster will be a tool. And they will care about how can they use that tool um, to execute parkour paths or the gameplay. They will care about its uh, gameplay functionalities. 
Parkour designers will not care about where it can be placed, is it red or blue? They will care about how it interacts with the player. Uh, maybe we need a new set of animation for it, or maybe it should be a very particular size in order to trigger particular animations. And getting all those information is, informations is very important for me because that way I can make sure that everybody is getting uh, everything they need from my concept art and nobody is left disappointed or confused. Um, because, because since in uh, Dying Light every asset had its parkour function, I'd really, I tried to really to focus on, uh, on its gameplay functionalities before I got into the visuals. And getting all those informations gives me the, the purpose of the particular artwork and gives me the understanding on assets function and role in the world. And once I know that, uh, know, once I know what everybody needs from the asset, understanding how it will influence the gameplay and so on, and how it will be used, um, uh, it's time to look at the old information that I gathered and see how those information influence each other. Because sometimes I will stumble upon contradictions. And for example, parkour designers might tell me when approached uh, that if, since I'm making a dumpster, I should make it 130 centimeters high in order for the player um, to play a short climbing animation. Because that's the animation that dumpster should have. But level designers might tell me, well, if you're making a dumpster, please make sure that it's 170 centimeters high so we can use it as a par parkour, th parkour path starter so once the player climbs on it, they can reach the first floor windows. And that's an easy contradiction that can be solved with one concept art without any problems just by making the lid a little bit slanted. But if I wouldn't go and wouldn't ask those people, if I didn't bother them and inform them that, um, that I'm going to be working on a dumpster, I wouldn't even have a chance to help them and, uh, and satisfy both of those needs. I wouldn't even know that they pro this problem exists. And sometimes, though, the, the information and needs may be so contradictory that, that they would just make the dumpster look really, really weird. Um, sometimes I get the chance to kill the bird with one, uh, multiple birds with one stone, and sometimes I get to use my good concept artist judgment to say, well, no, guys, no, that's not a dumpster anymore. That's something, not a dumpster, though. And the whole process of trying to figure out what that dumpster is, maybe, and shouldn't be, um, is the main priority for me, because I've noticed that during the production, assets change hands so many times that very often the concept artist is the only person that has all the information at the same time before anything is created. And it's important to have this information before I start drawing because, um, because otherwise people will see this information gathered in one place for the first time when they see the concept art. So if I don't know what are their questions, that's the t what are their questions, that's the time when, when they will start asking questions. And that's the time where I spend three weeks uh, iterating a concept art of a one dumpster. So that's what I'm trying to avoid. So I can either make a concept art uh, that makes people go, wait, but what about... Or I can make a concept art that makes people go, ah. And I, I can answer their question, qu questions before they, e before they even know that they had them. So to wrap it up, I always try to remember to answer more questions that I'm creating. Remember what, I am, what am I doing and why, and I'm trying to keep in mind people that are going to be affected by my uh, concept art. But wait, wait um, why do I even think it's my job? Shouldn't it all be included in the brief? Well, I explained my approach on really simple, symbolic uh, example of a stupid dumpster, but the exact, exact same thing and exact same mechanism uh, apply for a concept art of a character, of a weapon, of a location, anything I can think of. And the thing is, the bigger the team, the easier it gets to forget what we're actually doing. 
and we're making a game. A huge, impossibly complex production where anything can go wrong at any given time. And the experience of the final product is a sum of such an incredible number of factors. And it's really awesome when it's just a dumpster that went wrong. But sometimes it's entire locations. Sometimes it's entire maps. Sometimes it's entire projects. And a possible fuck up isn't always art related. And th sometimes there's nothing a concept artist can do to prevent this from happening, even if they know, if, if they even see the problem. But as a concept artist, I strongly feel that I should focus on those potential problems on my turf and trying to prevent them from happening or at least minimize the damage. Because it's very easy to just say, well, the brief was stupid. The people that gave it to me are idiots. It's very easy to get frustrated with uh, producers, art directors, scrum masters, whoever, for not understanding how that stupid dumpster, symbolic dumpsters, dumpster could have been important, especially if you get a half of a day to complete the, one of the most important assets in the game. But it's really easy to just say, it wasn't my job. But we're not in the game dev industry because we like things easy. Whatever your belief on this is, one thing stays unchanged. This doesn't get the, the game done. When you're sitting there and waiting for some mystical game dev god of information to give you a perfect brief, you're not getting anything, and you're not getting us closer to completing the game. So, kind of maybe not doing your job, because whatever you position in the production process, we, we, our task number one is make the game. So do whatever you can to get that going. Don't sit and wait. Get up and do the legwork. Ask, ask people, bother them, bother them with questions until they want to set you on fire. Because as a concept artist, you can become the link that joins all the information into one uh, before anything gets produced, placed on the level, and then carefully deleted. And you can become somebody, something that nobody else even has a chance to become. And that's a great power. And you know exactly how that goes. With great power comes great responsibility. And the day that I realized that my des design of a concept art can drastically influence the gameplay is the day that I felt huge humility to what I'm doing. And I can make somebody else's job so smooth they don't even realize how many problems we've dodged. But, or I can make them struggle and frustrate sometimes for years. And no matter your position, no matter your job, we all have one main objective, and that is to make the game. And in order for it to be called a game, it needs to be playable. So you can either help with that or make it difficult and create problems. And when I think about a um, huge number of people involved in projects like Dying Light, about their aspiration, hopes and dreams, about money behind it, how big of a machinery it is, and to know that I can fuck this all up, with one dumpster, that's the humility. Thank you.